Hey everyone, one of the questions I get a lot is what graphics software am I using? There's a lot of people out there wondering what in the world they can use to produce lower thirds and full screen graphics, whatever. You know, there's a whole bunch of different challenges that we have associated with producing graphics, especially in real time if we're doing live events. And I think a lot of people are disappointed by my answer because my answer to that question is I use my own. I actually wrote the software that I use for doing graphics. And I've never really demoed it here on the channel, and I thought it might be kind of nice to do that uh, here and give you guys a little bit of a peek about what the capabilities of the software are and kind of some of the mentality behind it when I created it. So uh, I'm going to take you through a lot of the major features. I'm not going to, not going to show everything. It would take too long. But I'm going to show you some of the major features of the software. Um, I should mention, however, that the software does look a little dated. because um, I wrote the majority of this back in 2004. And I've never really revamped the UI. So, yeah, it looks like software from from 17 years ago. Um, it actually started out as a project that, project that I was doing as a favor for a place here. It's called the Missionary Training Center. So it had had its roots in a religious purpose, but uh, that became that very much became just a small portion of the features that were available uh, in terms of the entire software package. And now it's, it is the primary tool that I use today for doing graphics for my events. And... One of the big reasons for that is it's quick, uh, but another reason is because it's my own software, I can tweak it to do whatever I want to. So if I get hired to do an event that uh, has a specific, specific needs that I don't have a, an answer for, I'll just modify the software in order to add it. So um, it makes it nice and easy. Also because I have a background with, um, with well, not just software development, but doing software development with, related to doing graphics and things like that. I was able to do things that were not being done by any other package at the time. So things like drop shadows and uh, doing proper rendering of the text. So uh, not using subpixel rendering so that it looks proper on any display and not just the specific monitor that a computer has been tuned for. But uh, but yeah, it, it really designed. It's been tweaked and designed to meet my needs over the years. So at the end of the video, I'm going to talk about software availability. Uh, I don't want to spoil that at the very beginning here. But uh, so anyway, I'm going to take you through some of the major features and let you see how a lot of it works. All right, so this is the user interface for the software. And I'm going to go up to a three-up view here. And so you'll see in the upper right-hand corner here, what the output is. So I'm going to be jumping a rack back and forth. I'm going to have to zoom in to the user interface so you can see what's going on. But uh, yeah, it was really designed to be used in a dual monitor environment. So one one monitor is being used to generate the graphics and the other monitor is used to output the graphics. And so yeah, that's, that's really ideal. It, it can work in a single monitor environment, but it's very much not ideal. Like whenever graphics live, you have no way of modifying the user interface. But because it's designed to work with two different monitors, you can be preparing the next slide while the current slide is visible. So it's really designed, it really is designed to be used and generate graphics in real time. You can create presets and save those, but it fundamentally was designed to do things on the fly. And that's really one of the main reasons that I did this versus trying to use another software package because everything is designed to work on the fly. So I mentioned that it has its roots in in uh, religious connotations, religious situations. So some of the stuff that I'm going to be doing here is, will make a little bit more sense. So, all right, so I'll just give you a very quick, quick one here. So one of the things that it can do is bring up verses out of scripture with very, very very, very quickly, essentially. So in this case, I'm going to type John 13, 34, and then hit press Enter, and then hit F5. And it, just like that, it generates the graphic. I don't have to do anything. I don't have to go look it up on a website, copy, paste. Just type in the reference and hit Go, and it can do... For example, if I want to do the entire chapter, I just leave out the verse number, and there it is. And then the F8 key navigates between, between pages, uh, forward, and then F7 goes back. And you can see here that it actually formats those very nicely. Uh, each verse is indent indented, has the verse number there. Um, it tries very hard to not break things across pages. So you notice as I page through here, there's very few places where it splits things between, between multiple pages. Uh, you also notice that it's doing nice justification. In fact, um, let me change the justification on this here. All right, so I'm going to do full justification at the top of the screen. So reformat this. Here we go. Now you got there. You go. So now it's full justified. So it goes back. It goes. It fills the margins all the way left to right. And 
gives it a nice consistent look. You can also notice that there's a drop shadow there. It displays the reference at the top of the screen in a smaller font and an italicized to just give it a different look. And th that can be moved to different locations that can be put at the end. Uh, it can be done as a header. Um, yeah, it can be part of the text. Lots of different options there. So, but yeah, so it's, it's able to do the lookup of that reference and automatically fill in the text and then with a single key press F5, uh, take that, take that live. All right. I'm gonna do that. Let me do this somewhere. Some, something similar with some text I pulled off the internet. This is just lorem ipsum. So I, just, I go to that tab, hit F5, renders it. You notice that each one of these tab pages actually has its own formatting because uh, different different types of text you're gonna to want to format differently. Some of it you're gonna to want to center. Some of it you're gonna to want to have less justified. Some of it you're gonna to want to have full justified. So those are certainly options for each one of these different tabs. So if I was to take this one and do full justification on that one. So there we go. So F5 and bingo. There we go. And then F8 to navigate between those pages as well. Um, so there's that. There's also, um, go back to the scripture here. So display the scripture. Uh, it also has the ability to include a picture as part of that. So I've already pre-selected this one. So I just mm -hmm. click on the checkbox here to enable the picture and then I hit F5 and there it goes. It displays the picture at the top of the screen with the text underneath and then you can still navigate the different pages there as well. So, and then you've got different layouts. So if we want to do a picture on left, same thing again. There we go. So automatic, you just choose any picture you want, JPEG, whatever, and uh, it automatically does all the formatting there. So one of the big concepts that I had for this software, let me go back to the Ipsum text here. There we go. Uh, one of the com fundamental concepts that I had with this software is that I wanted to separate the formatting from the actual content. That way you could have different templates that you wanted for the look and feel, but, th but then pull in different content. See, so the left side of the window, left two-thirds of the window here is the content, and the right, ha right side is the formatting. So if I come over here to, well, first of all, I've got the, ba the background. So I've got an angle gradient here, but I can also do solid colors. So I'll render it using a solid color there. In this case, it's black. Re-render, there we go with the blue. You notice as I transition there that it actually does uh, a dissolve between the different, um, between the different slides. So... Yeah, so there we go. So able to do different colors. It also has angle gradient. Uh, there's a square gradient too. Not something that I like. And again, it was the style of the era. We don't do much of that style anymore, but it is there. Um, so you also have the ability to include a pic picture in the background. So I'm going to select this and then hit a five. And there we go. So that's this is a picture of some flowers, and it's recoloring the image. Uh, I can say don't do not recolor. There we go. And so it using the original image and then puts the text on top of it, although that's very hard to read. Say so I recolor using three colors. So there we go. Yep. And so yeah. And then come over to the borders tab. So this basically allows you to set the screen border. So if I want to go to a preset where we do a 7.5% border, so take up a little bit more of the screen. There we go. There's that. Or if I wanted to go back, well, let's, let's do a 20% border. It's a 20% on every side, so yeah, not not visually appealing, but it works. And then there's some others down here. So so we can, there's like there's one for a lower third, and and an upper half with a 10%. So anyway, so yeah, a bunch of different presets there, and you can also drag those as well. So if I want to just take this bottom line and drag that up, you can, you can certainly do that. Set those at at will as you as you wish. All right. In terms of formatting, so you have a font, and then you can choose bold, I italic, underline. You can specify, instead of doing a, a font size, which didn't make a lot of sense to me because screens are different resolutions and whatnot, I just said how many lines of text do you want on screen. So in this case, I'm doing 12. And so as I render this, uh, there should be approximately 12 lines on screen. Uh, you can set the, the relative size of a reference. So for example, we go back to this John 13. You set the size of the reference there, and also that's where you specify bold, italic, underline for, for, the, for the reference. You can also specify a color for a background behind the text. So render that. There we go. Yeah, not super pretty, but it is an option. Anyway, you, can do, you can just do a soft edge on that if you want. So yeah, have it sort of blend. Not, not super pretty, and choose any color you want. Uh, you can also set the opacity on that. Uh, you can, I, in this case, I have a drop blur, drop shadow, essentially. 
and I've got the other other options as well and then you specify the size of the drop border relative to the text and different rendering methods because back back when I wrote this computers were not as fast as they are today and I had to do a lot of optimizations in order to be able to render this stuff in real time um, so yeah so I've got different methods for actually creating that drop border so uh, I've been able to improve that over time and com computers have actually gotten much 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 faster so uh, let's add a two pixel border a two pixel outline on the text there and it helps us sharpen it up a little bit um, but yeah that's an option so all right, uh, in terms of transition, by default, it does a crossfade, but we've got all these other ones. In fact, I'm going to stick it on random, random all, and then uh, let's go to the Ipsum text here. So, yeah, so I'll do a few transitions here, and you can see that it has a whole bunch of different options. And this is actually, honestly, the most fun part about creating this project is writing the code to do all these different transitions and be, and figuring out ways to make them happen in real time. So what you're watching here, I'm, I'm shooting this video in 4K, and it is actually rendering these videos, th these transitions in real time. And uh, because I was always benchmarking performance, I wanted to see uh, how fast my code was. And so I actually have, and yeah, I won't be able to see it very well, but... Uh, there we go. So it shows right here what the last transition was and how many frames per second it was able to do. So if I do another transition, so that was a funnel uh, and that 15 frames per second. So unfortunately, I can't really show all these full screen at the same time, but I can certainly. There we go. So yeah, so do do another transition. So what they call it? Let's see. Yeah, there we go. That was a Luma fade. Uh, it was custom sunburst rays, uh, pixelated triangles, right? And these these are all running right at 38 frames a second at the moment. So, but uh, anyway, so that was that was fun to come up with the code in order to produce all of those. Um, and there, there we go. There's preview. So you, yeah, I'll go, I can go full screen with that, as you guys can see. You can see a little bit better what what the different transitions look like. So. Yeah, in this tiny window, it's able to render at 2,100 frames per second, 3,000, 3,100 frames per second. So, anyway, but there's a ton of different transitions that I programmed in there, uh, quite a, more than I've seen <laughs> pretty much anywhere else. So yeah, we'll do a uh, flat flash to white. Yeah, and then add a dissolve. Yeah. So, anyway, a lot of, lot of uh, cool functionality there. The cross-dissolve, fa cross cross-fade cross was uh, the one that I had to put the most work into in order to, in order to get that to be high performance. Because you're moving at a lot of pixels, you know, 3840 by 2160, that's 8 megapixels, trying to push that data. Each one of those pixels has red, green, and blue values and trying to do all those calculations in real time and output that to a monitor was not tr super trivial to do uh, but i did get i did get working and it's running in this case running 30 fr 37 frames per second so i'm shooting at 30 so it's actually able to render that faster than than real time than, than is needed all right um I won't go into too much into automation but it has the ability to automatically advance slides that isn't necessarily super useful when you're doing text when you do pictures it can be and that has the option of playing back a music file in the background if you want so if you wanted to do a photo slideshow and have that play to music it has that capability didn't use that i haven't used that very often but it is there just in case all right um let's see let's go over to I'll just br briefly touch on this one. So this is the web tab. This actually has an integrated browser. It's not. It's not showing um, the actual website here in this case. I recalled this. I saved it and recalled this, and it only brought the text back. But, but you could. You could in the day. This doesn't really work any longer. Any longer. But you could in the day go to a website, highlight the text you wanted from that website, and it automatically produce a text. Use uh, produce a slide using that text. Uh, see, no copying and pasting, whatever. Um, unfortunately, this doesn't work. I'll show you just how bad it is here. So yeah, like, it doesn't handle HTML5. It doesn't handle modern JavaScript stuff at all. So I put my own website in there, and it just doesn't look great. But what I can do, though, here is highlight some text and then hit F5 to generate the slide, and bingo, there it is. It generates a slide using that text that I just highlighted. So there's a way of producing slides very, very quickly when the text you need is on a website so unfortunately 
web has moved on so far since uh, since I created this that uh, it's no longer that feature is no longer useful. Next one is name and title, basically a lower third. So you type in text for lines one, two, and three, hit F5, and it generates it. So yeah, very quick, very easy. Um, I very often do create lower thirds in this software, but I don't use this feature. I actually do it through on the quote tab. Um, so you can actually do some customization. There. So yeah, render that. Yeah, and it doesn't look right there, but if I take and make bottom, put that in the bottom center, it looks a lot better. And so when I do, when I do lower thirds, this is actually very often how I do it. I, I will use this feature of the software um, in order to enter the text and then have that automatically formatted. And I'll very often use that in conjunction with a background that I have either loaded into my ATEM switcher to go behind the lower third, or if an animation that's been pre-rendered on one of my hyperdecks, and then I'll have a button on my uh, my control panel, my excuse control panel, that will launch and will start actually start playback on that video clip. Select the right video source for a downstream key to come from the computer running this software, and then do a, a automatic transition in order to fade that in, and then fade it out after a certain period of time. So that combination works really, really well. So I'm able to just very quickly change the name in here. Hit a five, it generates the graphic hit the button on my ATEM control panel, and it just goes. So, yeah, very quick. Again, everything about the software was designed to render in real time. All right. Um, so I'm going to very quickly show you the pictures thing. So this basically allows you to select a whole bunch of images that you include as part of a slideshow. So it's very, yeah, very quickly bring that up. So, yeah. You can see that it's transitions between those. This is where the random transitions actually make a little bit more sense. You wouldn't necessarily use a lot of those with with uh, with text, but yeah, as I render, yeah, you can see it doing the different transitions there. So, anyway, uh, again, not necessarily a feature that I've used a ton, but it has come in useful um, at times in the past. So, a quick an image, it previews it. Um, you can add an entire directory at once with a single mouse click, that kind of thing. It has capability of playing back videos, though again, I haven't used that for a very long time. Uh, one of the main reasons is it's very selective about what video formats it supports. And at the time I created this, MPEG-4 wasn't even a concept in anybody's mind, so it doesn't support that. And I've never updated it to add that, just because I don't use this for doing video playback. I have other tools that work better for that. All right, so uh, the scroller. So this is basically my version of a teleprompter. And it's controlled using any, any uh, PC-compatible joystick. In this case, I use an Xbox 360 controller. I found just a short time ago that the... I'd been using... Recently, I've been using the Xbox One controllers. Uh, they have a better feel, and they feel a, a little bit higher quality. And I don't have to have a receiver dongle on the computer. It just uses Bluetooth. But discovered very very soon that uh, Xbox controllers, the whenever the application loses focus, so if you try and use another piece of software or click the desktop and whatever, that those joystick commands, the controller commands, don't go to that piece of software any longer. So I reverted back to the Xbox 360 because in this case, I can have my software active, or have my software in the background and still have things work with the, with the Xbox controller. So before I actually go into the user interface on this and show you some of the options here. So first of all, you've got your, your text that's going to be part of your teleprompter. And then down at the bottom here, you can set a default speed in words per minute. And so it'll automatically scroll at that speed if you want it to. You can also do horizontal or vertical flip in, in case you're, I mean, if you're actually using a prompter, you need to do a reversal, horizontal reversal, in order for things to look proper for, for talent. Um, but uh, so it has that option. It also has the ability to convert the, te the text to all caps. Some people prefer all caps. I prefer upper and lower, you know, normal, normal normal text, but some people prefer all caps, so that option is there. And then there, as you'll see in a second, there is actually a target window. So the idea is for the person who's speaking to make sure that the text that they're reading uh, stays within that target. So they can speed up or slow down uh, as, as needed. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and hit F5. All right, so I hit the Start button here. And as you can see, there is there's the text. And 
I can use the controller up down to speed up or slow down. I can also use the trigger triggers to speed up or slow down. So right trigger speeds up and then the left trigger slows down. If you press the tr left trigger all the way, it actually will stop. Um, but yeah, if I need to I need to scroll up or whatever, that's actually done with the left thumbstick in the software. So the idea here would be to keep the text within that kind of grayish bar that's appearing there on the top of the screen. Uh, uh, y key, Y button on the controller will just pause. And there's a whole bunch of other commands here. So um, let's see if I can remember. It's been a while since I've actually used this. Yeah, so they're faster scrolling. Um, so when I'm not, yeah. Normally there would be a, a, a guide up on screen to tell me what buttons do what, but uh, it's there. I apparently got a bug in the software that's preventing that from working. But anyway, so yeah. And then down at the bottom, you've got two progress bars. One is the progress through the document, and then the other is progress through. It's not showing the second one at the moment because I, because I, I'm actually restart it here and bring that back up. There we go. There we go. So yeah. So yeah. So there's there's a scroll bar that tells you how far you are through the document, and then if you set a target time, the amount of remaining, the amount of time you want for the entire thing to take, um, set the target speed at 180 words per minute. There we go. And then start. And there we go. So yeah, now it's showing. Now it's showing the two scroll bars. So again, the, the top one is the progress through the document, and then the bottom one is based on that. How long it should take based on that uh, that rate that you've set. So anyway, um, very cool. You can you can see it's going to design for multiple monitors. You'd have uh, the uh, text for the person who's controlling it and then the output that's just full screen going to going to your talent um, so anyway so I'll stop that yeah so here's, here's where you can actually set the uh, different uh, joystick controller cam commands and you can also use the keypad on a, on a keyboard or control that as well so yeah and there's several different options on how the timer things are handled as well so all right, so that's, that's kind of some of the major features, but it has a couple other cool things that are probably worth mentioning. So I've got my Ipsum text here, and, uh, well, I should mention that it actually has the ability to do preview. Um, so, for example, um, if I want to preview uh, what, a, what a slide is going to look like, I can actually do that and then see what those individual things are going to look like. This is all without disturbing the live, the live version of it. So anyway... Um, so yeah, there's preview, and then I also have a separate program window here, uh, and that's that's very small. So it actually, has this option to do a separate window, so you can open up your own window, and that's resizable. So I want to make that a little bit bigger there. Um, so yeah, so uh, this doesn't render near as frequently as the main output. You know, pr the priority is always making sure that that output window is up to date. The transitions are smooth. Uh, without any sort of jerkiness or whatever, so that's the main priority. And then the secondary priority would be making sure that the user interface for the person who's using it is kept up to date as well. But uh, but you, this is actually this is actually interactive here, and so I can click on this and highlight. So if I want to highlight some text, you'll see that that's showing up in both the main output and in this program window as well. But there's more to it than that, so I hit F6 to restore that, and then I can change that to text. And so in this case, as I highlight, it's actually changing the color of the text. Uh, and I have two different colors that, that can be used. So I've got yellow on the left mouse button, and then green on the right. And again, those are going to have different options there as well, in terms of whether it's highlighting text, or, or they're changing text color, or doing a highlight. There's also a scribble mode, so if I want to... There we go, so I select scribble and then just draw on there and that um, yeah that just shows up on program window as well at any point I can restore that to the, what it was before with F6 and then like I say F8 and F7 navigate between the different slides so so there's that um, there is this thumbnail view so you can kind of see what things are what things are going to look like ahead of time so you can see the previous the current and the next slide um, very small thumbnails on a modern display, 
Uh, but another feature that the software has is the ability to interrupt a sequence. So, you, so if, if you've pre-designed your your entire sequence of um, well, so <laughs> each element that you create, whether it be a uh, paragraph of text or a picture or a series of pictures or whatever, I call those presets. And then you have this thing over here, it's called a show, which is basically a series of presets. Uh, and you can have those pre ready and ready to go. But if you're doing a presentation and somebody interrupts you and say, hey, I have a question about this word, whatever, this has the ability to do what I would call an alternate sequence. And so you can interrupt your main flow and recall a preset or generate a new slide, you know, for example, copy paste text from somewhere or if it was working in modern modern websites, you go to the web page, find a web website uh, containing the answer to a question or whatever. So you can go and actually find that, create the slide, and then when you go to render it, you hold down the alternate key, and that basically puts what your previous previous show on hold. So you can do your interruption, whatever. You can create your alternate whatever, pictures, text, whatever. And then when you're done answering the question, you want to go back to your main slideshow, basically hit Alt F6, and then that takes you back to the sequence that you're originally starting on. So that way you're able to adapt dynamically to what's going on. And what I found with the software is that one person, who, the person who's doing the presentation would actually be able to handle create, doing their own graphics and be able to dynamically create new stuff on the fly as well. So anyway, um, so yeah, some cool, some cool functionality there. Um, also, go go a little bit bigger on this for you. So you're able to set the which you select which monitor you're outputting to and the display resolution for that monitor um, within the software. You don't have to go through. It's actually very very handy because it includes refresh rate as, as some of, as one of the various options. So you're not waiting through all the crazy Windows menus in order to find, in order to set um, resolution and frame rate. Windows it's a lot harder here. It's just a list. You click on the one you want and it changes it. It's also able to change the aspect ratio. So back in the day we were still doing mostly 4-3 stuff, but 16 by 9 was starting to happen a little bit. So I gave it the option to be able to do an override. So if your computer is outputting 4 by 3 but you need a 16 by 9 slide, you could basically say create 16 by 9 or vice versa. If it's outputting 16 by 9 and you need 4 by 3, you can select 4 by 3. So that's in there. Um, yeah, and then just got a handful, some some options there, um, but anyway, so it's it's different than anything else that's out there. So, I mean, I, two two big differences are one that the content and the formatting are separate. So, I I can set the formatting on, on the right portion of the screen, and and then change the content on the left side of the screen without affecting the formatting. So, if I created a slide or preset in another presentation, I can load that into my current presentation and have it still retain the look and feel of my current presentation without having, say for example, you know, when I originally created the slides, it had a red background and yellow text, something terrible, right? But, but I would be able to bring that content in by recalling that preset here on the upper, this upper dropdown and not mess up the formatting of my current sequence. And the way that's actually ha handled is these lock buttons. So on every one of these tabs, so background borders, formatting, etc. There's a lock button in there, and clicking the lock button basically made it so when you recall the preset that those the settings on that page are just ignored from that preset. Um, that way, you're again you're able to retain the look and feel. So you know you got a, a theme that you like to use. Uh, you're able to load that, lock it, and then any pre preset you load in will automatically follow that, and you don't have to re you don't have to redo all your slides. Um, because the formatting has changed. So anyway, so that's available for background, borders, form formatting, transition. Uh, yeah, so basically all the things that control the look and feel of your slides uh, can be locked so that you're not interrupting the visual style of your presentation uh, by loading presets from another presentation or whatever. So. Yeah, but then there's that, and the other one is the ability to create, create these, create this content in real time. It really is, it, it it's actually been very rare for me to produce content ahead of time in this software. For the most part, 
I'd say 95% of the time when I've used this, I'm using it to generate content on the fly, uh, on demand, as needed. Um, so for that reason, I don't necessarily put a whole lot of time into generating graphics before an event because I know I have this software. Somebody says, hey, I need, a lo I need lower thirds. I'm like, okay, no problem. I'll just load my software uh, and it's, it's done. You know, it's, it, it's just there. It's ready to go. So it makes it very, very easy, very, very quick. Uh, so anyway, now <laughs> the software is not perfect. It has it has a handful of issues. Uh, one of uh, one of which actually surfaced while I was doing this video: the fact that it didn't recognize it was running in multi-monitor mode while I was doing trying to do the teleprompter thing. But anyway, it's but it's there. It's mine. It works. I've been using it now since 2004. And aside from a ton of new features I added back back in the day, back when I first create, first wrote it, I've had to do very, very little to it. Uh, it's, it's worked very well for most of the events that we we actually handle. Um, and it handles such a wide variety of different things. You know, so graphics, photos. But the two big ones really are generating uh, text and lower thirds on the fly, and then the teleprompter feature. So those have been the most heavily used of anything that's in there. Now, I know there are people that are watching this are going to say, hey, this is cool, how can I get my hands on it? Well, <laughs> you can't, unfortunately, um, for a, a few different reasons. And I've been meaning to do a video specifically about this one, about, about this topic, but I'll, I'll address it here. So, there, <laughs> there's, uh, the big reason I, I don't release a lot of my software well, two two big reasons. One, I don't I don't necessarily have or want to put the time into putting that final bit of spit and polish on software in order to make it commercially viable. Uh, that's in order to get software to the point where it's functional and usable. Might take I don't know, well just an example. We'll say this say this software maybe took me a thousand hours. Spent a thousand hours just getting it to work. And getting that extra spit and polish, which doesn't affect any of the functionality in any kind of way. It's just basically improved visuals, improved usability, theming, uh, a website for selling it, supporting it, a shopping cart in order to sell it. That extra piece might take not a dozen hours. That extra piece might take another 400 hours. And... So, to me, that's it, it. Hasn't been worth it. It's just not worth. It's not worth what it would take. The investment it would take in order to in order to take it from where it is today in order to something that I could actually turn around and sell. Um, but a big part of that is supporting it. Um, when, back back in the day, I sold software on the internet, and I've I've done that before. And the support aspect of it takes way more time than the develop development of it. And I know. A lot of people think, oh, I'm never going to need support. I'm never going to ask for support. But inevitably, there's something that doesn't work the way that you expect it to or encounter some sort of situation. Uh, they're totally unexpected, and the software doesn't deal with it in a way that someone might want it to. And so at that point, you need some help. And quite frankly, I just don't have the time. I work the equivalent of about three full-time jobs as it is right now, and I just don't have... I don't have any buffer in my schedule to handle the, the request that the people might send my way when things don't work the way that they expect them to. And for that reason, I wouldn't feel right about offering this software for sale. Like someone pays me money for the software and then I don't have time to help them when something goes wrong. I just, I don't, I morally can't do that. And so for, that's, that really is the big one. Like I don't want to, to be offering something that people pay money for if I'm not able to give, give them the time that they need in order to make it work right. My conscience wouldn't allow me to do that. So that's, that's been the big one. That has been uh, huge, uh, preventing me from taking a lot of the software tools that I've created uh, and making them available. Now, I know there's people out there that are going to be saying, well, what if you made it available for free? <laughs> a couple years ago, I thought about doing that. I really thought very seriously about taking this, a lot of the software tools that I use and just putting them out there and letting other people use them. But uh, I found out within the last six months or so that that doesn't eliminate the people, <clears throat> the constant deluge of people that are that ask for support. So, um, you know, on this channel, I have made some of my software available for free. Uh, I produce the software that does the super, super source animated transitions on the. ATEM switchers that, that support it, 
Um, that's totally changed the game for me with my business, and I thought I'd be doing the world a favor by putting those out. And then uh, back in January, I produced a video on how to set up your own RTMP server and pre-did pre configuration files that would make that very easy for people. And I thought, the thought in my mind at the time was, if I make this available for free, people won't expect that I will, I will support it. Well, I turned out I was completely wrong on that. And I have been bombarded nonstop in both cases with people asking for help on those things. And... I would like to help, but I just don't have that kind of time, unfortunately. And so, at this point, I'm kind of even shying away from putting anything out there for free, just because the very act of making it available causes people to feel like they're justified in asking for help uh, when something doesn't work the way that they expect it to. So, even though I've made the tool available for free, there's a community out there to help. I still, on any given day, just between the the animated super source macros and the RTMP stuff, I get half a half a dozen emails from people asking me from help for help on those things, and I unfortunately just don't have the time. So, so as much as I would like to make the software available, I just can't because of the <clears throat> because of the additional uh, headaches, potential headaches that it can cause me, and so I've elected at this point to keep this to myself. <laughs> And the reason I'm making this video, even though the software's not available, is like I would love to, I love to share some of these ideas with people. So if there's somebody out there that has the time to create to create some software, you can actually take some of the ideas that I've had from uh, with this and run with them. Um, I'm I don't think I'm going to be doing additional development on this tool. I may someday produce an entirely new graphics tool in order to meet the needs of what what's going on today. You know, today we're doing things very differently than we did 2004 when I created this, and I do find some limitations with this. I would love to be able to, say, for example, have the output of this go directly to a deck link card um, and support alpha transparency, which are things that weren't really viable back when I first created this. Uh, but the architecture of the software prevents me from really being able to do that effectively, and it would re really require a rewrite to do it right. And I just don't have the time in my schedule to do that, um, nor, nor would, would, would it be easy for me to justify well, all that time to give me a little bit of additional functionality over what I have now. Um, so, especially considering that I don't have any plans to sell or market any of this, any of the software uh, to the public. So, anyway, so that's a very long explanation. But bottom line is, as much as I would like to make these tools available to people, I I just can't do it anymore. Um, I feel like I've been taken advantage of on the other free tools that I've put out there. And I don't want to add any more to my existing load, you know. So I am working the equivalent of three jobs, three full-time jobs at the moment, which between my software and video and this YouTube channel uh, and other things that I do, you know. I work every hour of every day, and I just don't have the time to address any any people asking asking the. Uh, I don't have any. I don't have the time to um, help people out when things don't go the way that they expect them to. So. Anyway, but I hope this video has actually helped people to understand a little bit better about my workflow and understand my reasoning for some of the things that I did within the software and maybe get some ideas that somebody else can use some, some in their own software if they choose to create something, some sort of tool that's similar to this. So, but yeah, this, I know this is very different and it works very, very well for my workflow uh, and it's been a great tool to have. So anyway. If you have questions about it, you can certainly leave those in the comment section down below, and I'll do my best to answer those things. Uh, I, I think I'll go ahead and create a channel on my Discord server for this software, so people can uh, talk about it there, and maybe we can kind of further this, this discussion a little bit and explore options to make some of this stuff, make some of these ideas available, whether it's uh, through somebody else's software or who knows what. But anyway, so well, I'll, I'll create a discussion. Uh, channel on my discord server so that's at djp.li slash discord and we can talk about this there so anyway that's going to do it so thanks everyone for watching and have a great day